We must speak the truth about terror. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories. Malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves. Take your own advice. What happens? I tell you what happens. Blam! I have a window that looks directly at the World Trade Center, and I saw... No delusion! Shit's getting way too complicated for me. And what Trump's going to do is just declare victory, right? He's going to declare victory. But that doesn't mean he's the winner. He's just going to say he's the winner. The Democrats, more of our people vote early that count. Theirs voted mail. And so they're going to have a natural disadvantage, and Trump's going to take advantage of it. That's our strategy. He's going to declare himself a winner. So when you wake up Wednesday morning, it's going to be a firestorm. We're going to have Antifa crazy, the media crazy, the courts are crazy, and Trump's going to be sitting there mocking, tweeting shit out, you lose. <laughs> I'm the winner. I'm the king. And he'll be all over. He'll be, he'll be going, where's Hunter? Is Hunter on a crack pipe? I mean, no, he'll be, because then it doesn't matter. Remember, here's the thing. After then, Trump never has to go to a voter again. He's going to fire Ray, the FBI director, fire the scene. He's going to say, fuck you. How about that? Because he's never going to, he's, he's done his last election. Oh, he's going to be off the chain. He's going to be crazy. <laughs> also, also if, Trump <laughs> is, if Trump is losing by 10 or 11 o'clock at night, it's going to be even crazier. You're he, crazy. No, because no, he's going to sit right there and say they stole it. I'm, yeah. going to the court, uh, Agreed. I'm directing the attorney general mm-hmm. to shut down all ballot places in all 50 states. It's going to be mm-hmm. no. He's not going out easy. If, Trump, if Biden's winning, mm-hmm. Trump is going to do some crazy shit. Welcome to The Antidote. This is Greg McCarran. And this is Jeremy Roth Show. All right. It is Monday, August 28th, 2023. And what we just heard was a clip of Steve Bannon um, laying out uh, um, the based the idea or the that Donald Trump, if uh, things looked sketchy on election night, would just declare himself the winner and just start firing people left and right and start having voting you know, precinct shut down and all this and that. And uh, we thought that was a good uh, clip to play um, in the light of, you know, what we're going to be talking about here, which uh, has happened since the last time we recorded, which is the most recent indictment of uh, Donald Trump in the uh, in the state of Georgia directly involving um, shenanigans. And shenanigans is an understatement involving uh, electors and, uh, and efforts to overturn the vote. Of course, the whole Brad Raffensperger uh, shakedown, which people will say was not a shakedown, actually, and uh, find the 11,000, whatever many votes and all of this. And so, um, you know, I thought that's a good launching pad to get into. Uh, we're going to have a conversation here, and it may, we may stretch out into a couple other matters interrelated to this. But, um, you know, just thinking about the the indictment and just playing that clip, by the way, coming from the same person who said all hell's going to break loose on January 6th and then denied that uh, he actually meant anything by that, that being Steve Bannon, of course. And uh, so, uh, Jeremy, um, you got any thoughts on this clip and the recent, uh, obviously, we got a lot of thoughts we're going to get into, but just uh, as it relates to that clip and then the general sentiments around this indictment in the state, um, the atmosphere of where we're at. I don't I don't care about any of these facts, whether recorded or not, Greg, that you're trying to push on us here. I'll just go with Laura Loomer's T-shirt, Donald Trump. Didn't do nothing wrong with the antidote addendum, except rape probably multiple underage uh, people, including Katie Johnson. Very, very likely, I would say. Um, so other than that, yeah, no, no problem here. The Rico, the the accused Rico conspiracy in Georgia that uh, Trump was at the epicenter of, including his lawyers, uh, that now all of the MAGA people are saying, once you start indicting lawyers, now you're really in sort of end of uh, the Republic kind of uh, scenario here. You I mean, it's uh, it's it's obvious within the 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 both the professional ethics of the law, but also in the law itself. It's very well articulated that a lawyer, just because they're a lawyer for a client and that they have attorney client privilege are not allowed to use their attorney client privilege or their professional privilege as a member of the bar, let's say, uh, to, to, uh, crime. You're not allowed to be a lawyer and crime that you're not allowed to be, to use your position as a lawyer to do, uh, conspiracy. 
uh, including against the U.S. government uh, or against the American people and their democratic voting rights in relationship to the Constitution. They're just responding to all the crimes of the deep state, though, you see. And um, and also when 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 Trump and Michael Flynn, Alex Jones, et cetera, were chanting lock her up and uh, Hillary for prison and all this, that was just they didn't really mean anything by it. And when all these QAnon people were doing it, well, they don't have any influence anyway. They're just on the fringes and no one, no one's influenced by them. I mean, this is different now. This is actual targeting of political opponents. You know, you, and um, and it's you know, that's how they would they would frame it that this is different. And and then also uh, it's either like this is unprecedented and or um, this is uh, we're just you know at the very least they're not doing anything that the deep state people that are targeting them haven't already done. So, I mean, it gets lost in these types of arguments, but you're, you're exactly right about this. And uh, this is a, I would say a pretty twisted uh, interpretation of like the, um, of the standing of uh, figures such as the people that are now finding themselves as the defendants in this, in this latest indictment. And I would say that the uh, Bannon really audio confession, I'd say, that we heard is even it's worse than even you portrayed it, Greg, because he's not saying in the if something is sort of shady on election night, we're going to sort of seize the moment. No, he then says adds in if Biden is up 10 percent, it's going to get really crazy. That's when Trump's going to really get crazy. Um, so they were guaranteeing that this was their plan, no matter what the scenario on election night really was. And Bannon even discloses that the the mail-in ballots that they tried to make a big deal of after the fact, and even some sort of like people who were hardcore uh, election fraud uh, alleges uh, on behalf of uh, Trump the con, uh, they've now backed off of the very hard election fraud uh, claims, you remember the sort of Venezuelan uh, uh, voting system fraud or the Italy-China-based voting fraud. They, they've, Roger Stone claiming that North Korean votes were brought into the shore of Maine to uh, with fake ballots. <laughs> or Steve Pachenik with the, with the blockchain watermark, uh, Trump was going to frame them. All of Stuff that, yeah. yeah. So the thing that we had... Yeah, they think the head of the uh, the Freedom Caucus, uh, Scott Perry, was said to be pushing as far as like Italy and uh, and all that. So yeah, a lot of stuff. And then of course, two thousand mules and Mike Lindell's circuses uh, forums have just added all that all of that. So I mean, it's a it's a confusing mess, but it is interesting what you're pointing out here of like some of these most uh, some of like these biggest original narratives of like voter fraud being a. Uh, you know, being backed down on as uh, as things escalate and as things go on. Yeah, and so what I'm saying is that they've backed, they've sort of stepped back to the position of co- the sort of the use of COVID to change the laws around uh, mail-in ballots, right? So, so really, what you know, in in actuality, it's actually pretty secure. You have a you have a, a list of voters. And you have to put your a signature to it in relationship to uh, a um, a registered voter. It's a crime uh, with punishment to uh, fake a mail in ballot. And so the the mega light, let's call them at this point, are have now abandoned these stronger positions and have now retreated to the the idea that the mail and ballots themselves were the fraud combined with the media manipulation and the collusion between the U S government and Twitter, uh, to suppress the Hunter Biden story. Now it's interesting too, that Bannon, even in that clip is refer- referencing how Trump is going to go, you know, buck wild on the Hunter Biden crack pipe. Now, he didn't say about the hun- driving 170 miles per hour and the hookers and all of that. But that was all implied in that, that this was going to be the other way that they were going to go if Trump lost in a bigger fashion, which is what we've seen. So so I'm just pointing out that they've they basically followed the uh, the roadmap, the Bannon strategy. Um, to precision for now, we're now going on two and a half years, really, in terms of the uh, the wake of that. So that 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 all, all goes to say that basically we are still contending with 
the uh, you know the Jan- the uh, twenty twenty election, and then obviously January six. And so what we're seeing now is there is just little bits of legal accountability that are coming in a little late in the game, really, but are beginning to uh, triangulate around a combination of conspiracy to defraud to, to defraud the U.S. government in relationship to. Uh, Jack Smith's uh, the the later uh, uh, prosecution um, of Trump in terms of that covers really like the the architecture behind the, what Bannon is describing in the run up to the 2020 election into then January 6 as some kind of then Plan B really right and uh, and then now the Fannie Willis uh, indictment down in Georgia. Then it first is the first to break out the question of RICO, of racketeering, of conspiracy, of uh, organized crime, really, right? And this is where Giuliani made his name, of course, right? And uh, we were talking about that context, that deeper context here of the of Giuliani now, uh, you know, facing what he originally uh, used to make his name as a U.S. prosecutor. Uh, in terms of cleaning up the mainly Italian mob and really clearing the way for a combination of a further rise of the Jewish organized uh, crime syndicate of the the wake of Lansky, right? And uh, you got to look at someone like Roy Cohn. But then the the intense emergence and very quick rise, especially post Soviet Union, of Russian organized crime with a with a beachhead in the New York City area and Brighton Beach, obviously, but also just Manhattan and thinking about all of the real deep political background of Trump as a long-term cultivated asset of Russian intelligence with... His business is being, uh, his business is looking to be uh, just fronts for all types of uh, money laundering and money washing from these from these interests. Yeah, and, and, and really some of the, the you know, the investigative journalism of someone like Craig Unger, what he really contributed was going into the the archives and the the records to show exactly how much money was flowing into Trump properties uh, via very likely Russian organized crime. So again, we're just talking about the actual, in this case, the Russian deep state that Rudy Giuliani then cleared the way. And the Russian deep state, as any deep state, as we pointed out, the deep state architecture, the the conceptual understanding of deep politics uh, and the deep state that was then hijacked very specifically for consciousness operations, for psychological operations via neuro-linguistic programming with the rise of of MAGA and Trump, especially in 2016, that that was then hijacked, right, to sort of, you know, make it all about George Soros and Barack Obama and the dem- the demon rats or the Democrat Party as it's become the sort of the main nomenclature of basically all of the Republicans at this point. Uh, and But meanwhile, the actual intellectual lineage of understanding deep politics in the deep state is... Intelligence, especially covert operations, a national security state at the helm, and then the world of un- organized crime, of uh, of uh, you know uh, uh, black economics, uh, of underworld economics, the world of organized crime uh, on the bottom half, and one of you know our early hypotheses about what the Trump operation represented in 2016, post 9/11 was that this represented the the inversion maybe maybe in some way the first time that really there was a really intense inversion of the american deep state where the uh, or organized crime underworld had really sort of almost in some way overthrown the national security state or at least asserted its uh commanding position in an actual candidate who became president. Now, obviously, none of that means that we didn't have, you know, mobbed up people who became president, obviously. And and actually, there's a lot of talk now 
uh, especially they, by like, you know, the sort of the, the Republican candidates about Ronald Reagan and uh, the continuing argument about uh, Ronald Reagan's conservative legacy. But remember, that was also who, who candidate Barack Obama pointed to as an American politician who he one admired. The, <laughs> one of the examples of a big problem with like this romanticization of like of official quote unquote history and all this that you know Ronald Reagan is seen as like this this titan even by people who may have disagreed with him politically or whatever you know he's the the throwback to respectable politics and all this and he wasn't as tarnished and dirty as Nixon so it's even safe for even like you know liberals who may have seen him as like a uh, his policies as bad or whatever but you could still hold him up as like you know this is you know the respectable like the way people like you know will talk about like the the Bush family also to an extent. But with Reagan, there's this particular romanticization that works, I think, that makes it effective when, like, you know, quote, unquote, liberals do it as well, because Reagan is seen as, like, this iconic figure who has been um, given, like, this special status over the last four decades within the conservative culture. So, like, when, a, when Obama, like, a liberal, you know, democratic uh, establishment figure is seen as, like, or people of, like, the bipartisan political tradition, all this, are upholding Reagan, like, in this way, like, I think it, um, I think it's, uh, I think it has a very uh, negative effect, ultimately, for that reason. Yes, and in, in, and even at the, you know, the early years of the, of Trump, we were pointing out that that Reagan himself, in in a certain way, was maybe the best pointed to uh, predecessor or you know prior archetype of what Donald Trump actually was, right? The combination of an actor, right, with it with a little bit of this sort of outsider status coming from California in terms of Reagan, but mainly this actor question, the the patriot actor. Uh, really as the main archetype of what we then saw with the Donald Trump. Uh, and, and Reagan obviously was the asset of, you know, what Gus Russo's book, The Super Mob, really describes. And Lou Wasserman and the Hollywood, uh, ho- Hollywoodification of the mob, which the super mob being really the uprising of a you know of largely russian jewish immigrants with who came up within a very very tightly uh geographically knit uh neighborhood and set of neighborhoods in chicago so you're talking about then the uprising of the jewish mob in a chicago uh uh you know context in relationship obviously to the italian mob and then and then the big move west really Right. With Las Vegas being a key outpost and then uh, California and Hollywood and L.A. being like this crucial aspect. And so this is one reason why we continued to focus in on Justice, then Justice Anthony Kennedy's legacy, his his father's role as a mobbed up political lawyer in California then his son's role, Justin Kennedy's role in the financial underworld aspect of Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank being identified as probably the mo- the biggest outpost in the Western financial system of the of the Russian deep state and Russian organized crime specifically. And then Donald Trump then receiving the, this key banking support via Deutsche Bank. Uh, at the very same time, I believe in a parallel timeline, as then Donald Trump's financial woes were then being propped up via these very Russian sphere oriented, um, uh, you know, uh, folks in terms of the Tamir Sapir, uh, the that that whole uh, you know s- scenario of the Trump Soho. And all of that, where there's a big uh, uprushing of of Russian sphere money that comes in to uh, bolster Donald Trump's uh, alleged empire. And of course, there's Donald Trump Jr. on the record of talking about Russian money is crucial yeah. to us and all that. Right. So th- I just wanted to point out that a lot of this is very, very overt. The evidence pointing to what then some people want to call the Russia hoax or the Russia collusion hoax or even then just blame it all 
only on this sort of Bamford interpretation uh, published in the very shady Nation magazine, uh, which is very much we've analyzed part of his book, uh, Spy Fail, which is very good in certain ways, especially around Arnon Milchan's background and other things. But it is largely a limited hangout to the 11-9 operation in the same way that I pointed out that I identified Bamford even back when he was identifying Israeli companies in relationship to NSA outsourcing post 9-11 mass surveillance was doing a limited hangout of the 9-11 operation. So Bamford is still in place as this sort of, you know, uh, he is a, an important investigative journalist, but he gets crucial facts wrong in certain cases and he limits the hangout of the deep political understanding from these crucial events from 9-11 to uh, 11-9. And so in that, in that context, the, the overt and, and brutally uh, open nature of the Trump crime syndicate, uh, especially in the run-up to the 11-9 operation in 2016, is all sort of open to some extent if people are willing to uh, not just try to deny it with Laura Loomer type uh, sort of know nothing attitudes of Donald Trump did nothing wrong because I have it on my t shirt. <laughs> right. It's, uh, right. And you make some make some really good points there. And um, going back even to the topic of uh, it's interesting. Like uh, Reagan would be this prototype in terms of like this revered figure who was uh, put on this special pedestal of like uh, of being lionized by the Republicans, by the you know conservative population, and uh, everything from the the MAGA people to the never Trumpers will try to say you know we're upholding the legacy of Reagan and all this. Meanwhile, there is this other background of Reagan that um, that had to do with this uh, you know this creation of him. I mean, going back and being uh, this guy who in the, uh, in the McCarthy era leaves the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party is a uh, you know, is uh, too friendly to uh, to seditious communists, and um, is basically not. And that, in, in, uh, in moving on into the Republican Party, in this idea of like, you know, this is Americana. We are we we love our country, and we promote the right economic principles, and all of this. And uh, they're very much being like this uh, this background and this hidden hand there with that with a with a Hollywood figure like Reagan, and uh, and I. And as a prototype in that way, I think that's important. But I would also say the other prototype to Trump, it seems like at least within like uh, presidents would be um, uh, Richard Nixon, who was uh, also had his own, I think, their own mob affiliations and certainly had a lot of very dirty, very shady people around him and was also maybe like an inverse to Reagan, whereas like Reagan was this um, person whose presidency I don't think was looked at fondly at the time, like by liberals uh, or by the the, the upholders of quote unquote official history and all this, whereas Nixon was seen as this combative figure who had the whole media against him. And he he and his vice president Agnew, who was also railroaded, they punched the the bullies in the mouth and they didn't they weren't going to let, you know, they weren't going to be picked on by the media establishment and the Democrats and their media outlets that hated him so much. And uh, and there's a there's a prototype there and uh, Nixon being like, I guess, a prototype for like the hated the hated uh, Republican president who was uh, trying to, but also though, there's a difference I would say between these other people and between a Donald Trump or as like, uh, you know, Nixon, and maybe this was just differing norms at the time. I mean, maybe there's something to do with like the, the norms were different to where like, you know, the society when Nixon was elected president or Reagan wasn't elected president, it wasn't the same as 2016 when you've had like all of this um, lot of things going on that changed in those within those decades but there could be an argue there could be maybe a uh terms of like what the public was or was not ready for in terms of character and behavior and all this from a president but there's a difference in that you know these guys were at the end of the day i think a nixon and a reagan like they were politicians and like our presidents have always been uh they've always had political backgrounds i mean even reagan being like this mobbed up uh, hollywood iconic figure was still a uh, legitimate governor of Florida or of California, I'm sorry. And Richard Nixon, of course, was a was obviously a lifelong politician. And there's a difference here in that um, there's a difference in the level of decorum. Whereas a Nixon is maybe as uh, nasty as he had a reputation for being in certain ways, would never 
behave publicly in the manner of Donald Trump. Like, you know, he would never publicly talk like the way Trump would talk publicly about his political rivals or whatever, or the the very um the the crass way that Trump would uh, describe things. But also I think this would apply even to like uh, a Nixon. Um, that there was still uh, there are a couple of things I think were still significant in that one, there was still like a even their own party, there were people who would like still rein these things in or find limits and it would still be the majority of the party, I think would still like have uh, have issues with or maybe this is going too far trying to do certain things that were going on. And you don't have that now with Trump is like the GOP, I think, has been taken over in a way that it really hasn't been before. And we've talked about that, like uh, GOP becoming much more of like a an owned party, it seems like, by actual foreign foreign entities combined with all these corrupt uh, domestic interests that have been there. But also there was a limit in terms of like, I think the depths that certain people were willing to stoop to, maybe through a combination of maybe having like a check and balance over them, even by people within their own administrations, but then also obviously the political party that they're part of. And also um, that they're they're not there's a difference between i think these other people who have gotten into the office of president and then somebody like a trump who is like basically a lifelong front man for multinational organized crime interests masquerading as legitimate business interests and being some type of mob boss himself it's like this man just can't and the people around him just can't help themselves from committing crimes and continuing to commit crimes and just in a manner that is much much different than just corrupt politics as usual which are most of our other political figures who have made it to this type of office would traditionally involve themselves. It's, and it's just taken to a different level. And I think it's a combination of just how taken over the the, uh, the administration was and also the party that uh, that was that the administration was uh, was part of in terms of the Republican Party. And then also just this background. It's just much different than the traditional political background these other figures have come from to where there's way more of a a brazenness and way less of like a concern for like the traditional uh, limits of holding office and what we would call corrupt politics as usual, which we're not saying we need to go back to and we need to have a, we need to be able to have a solution to all of this as well. But it's much different than like the types of things that Trump and company have been involved in. And in the case of Trump going on many decades and the people who, um, who, uh, people who mentored him and then also many of the people around him as well. Yes. I said a mouth. No, yes. And the, the, this is, um, important and correct domestic political analysis. And then when you combine that with the actual chaotic and weaponized political phenomenon that's being pushed via the Trump quote unquote movement, and you really see the danger uh, of of the moment, I think, uh, in terms of the geopolitics of all of this and and beginning to really uh, sort through the nature of the evidence that points to the massive amount of not only, quote unquote, ally or friendly involvement, right, which would include the highest levels of the Israeli government at the time, Saudis, UAE, and beyond in the Middle East, but then also directly into what would be, you know, termed, uh, you know, nemesis or rival uh, or competitor uh, countries in terms of Russia and China, uh, in terms of uh, a lot of the deeper background uh, of all of this. And that would include even then, you know, the people who are being looked at as, you know, maybe a backup to Trump or a Trump stocking horse like Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, lots of questions around his background in terms of closeness with people like uh, Wexner. His wife works at the the Wexner funded uh, medical center at Ohio State University, I believe. Um, but beyond that, and then also questions of Russian and in the background. A Chinese connection. Then there's also the very Trump kind of scenario of where Trump, uh, one of his main, his at least his quote unquote movements talking points is George Soros, the devil behind the devil demon crap behind the deep state. Right. We now know all of the actual uh, Finkelstein network background to the orchestration of all that, all the way on up to Netanyahu's son Yair putting forth the Soros uh, and quote unquote anti-Semitic memes of the tribe, the right. pyramid of power. 
expressed in major media by Glenn Beck on Fox back in the early years of the Obama administration, and then Beck uh, being like this hugely religious Zionist partisan, and then uh, you know uh, plays the role of the decency and politics guy before putting on the red hat and all that. So it was a uh, mainly, I would say, the uh, the main um, mass media. Uh, pusher of this narrative was uh, was Glenn Beck in the early days of the Obama administration while the, during the rise of the weaponized Tea Party, being this religiously fanatic Zionist. And so while, you remember, while Trump was trying to, you know, uh, both a combination, let's say, uh, preemptively paint Soros and Epstein Maxwell onto Hillary Clinton, both of which were true, in in large part, it now seems, in looking in terms of the Roy Cohn, Roger Stone, Steve Bannon type strategy, he was uh, getting ahead of his uh, defending his Achilles heel, being like, oh, yeah, George Soros was involved with Trump in Chicago building. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy was a Soros uh, fundee in maybe just about a decade ago. Um, but so you begin to like see a very similar kind of setup with the 2024 elections in certain way. Now, obviously, it's way uh, different in certain ways in terms of all the rise of all of these cases against Trump. Um, but just the presence of Vivek Ramaswamy and his talking points and the, the fact that he's obviously a supporter, stalking horse of some sort in terms of the Trump operation uh, being, uh, of course, maybe the, the first person of the Republicans who were debating while Trump uh, had done his uh, interview, his quote unquote interview uh, with uh, Tucker Carlson uh, Ramaswamy being the first one to raise his hand about pardoning Trump. So, and then you go and you begin to see the Israel connection again here too, uh, in terms of uh, Ramaswamy and uh, this group that we pointed out before at Yale that uh, Cory Booker, by the way, we pointed out, uh, you know, was part of, Not, I guess he founded it, called Shabtai. Right. And Ramaswamy was part of this uh, this uh, Jewish skull and bones type sort of for gra for postgrads at uh, at Yale. And uh, and this is not just some kind of, you know, Jewish club. No, this hooks right into members of the highest levels of the Israeli security state, really of the Israeli deep state, too. We would say, including, you know, lots of Barack's uh, involved and a ton of really crucial uh, Israeli state security players and political players uh, in there. And so, of course, this is what uh, the people who are pushing Vivek will not, they're not going to deal with this aspect or the question of his uh, involvement with actual the, the Chinese state in terms of his uh, uh, pharmaceutical endeavors or even his pharmaceutical endeavors themselves, which are highly suspicious financially and then also seem to be tied into the COVID moment around questions of uh, mRNA, nanolip uh, nanolipids and all of this. Uh, so just wanted to point out that we are still dealing with this very deep political uh, moment now with this overlay of, you know, what I would say could be potentially, you know, a, a uh, fascist version of uh, Eugene Debs in the, in the guise of Trump running from, uh, in running for president uh, as uh, some jailed dissident or something like that. But I do think, Greg, we should just at least read the first few paragraphs of the the evil, the evil Fanny Willis, the Soros indictment. It's a fake news indictment. Um, I think that's a good idea. And I'll, before we do that, I'll add on a couple of a couple of things. And um, one is that uh, Vivek, um, he is a very, I'd say he's gotten the conspiracy culture, weaponized conspiracy culture talking points down pretty well. I, uh, you know, the way he talks about September 11th in this pretty well controlled um Weapon, uh, limited, limited conspiracy, MAGA conspiracy culture type of uh, 
of manner. And then also a moment I noticed at the uh, debate the other night where uh, where he and Nikki Haley were going back and forth about Ukraine. You know, Nikki Haley's pushing what we'd call the paleo neocon talking point about how we need to stand with Ukraine against Russia and we can't allow Putin's aggression to go un undealt, you know, not be dealt with. And Ramaswamy's response is basically to say that uh was to say that um oh uh I'm sorry, Lockheed Martin and Raytheon are waiting for her for her future careers after her political career is over. So, I mean, he's pretty, uh, you know, he's he's pretty, he's pretty good in that regard. And he's a pretty good attack dog in that regard. And so, you know, you uh, but you also see like there's obviously this 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 background and this this history there with someone like him and all three of these candidates who the MAGA people seem to like, whether it be Trump, Ramaswamy or Robert Kennedy Jr., there's this. There's the there's this factor dynamic about all three of them in different ways, but it but it does exist. And then I'll just say something about going back to the indictments um, before you start to read from this uh, Georgia indict this Georgia indictment. Um, I wanted to go back and to say a couple of things about that. One is that this does seem to be this is uh, people these are people picking up and doing the things that the um, as we get closer to the prospects of like another Trump presidency and all the consequence that will come out of that as we get closer to that uh, and after two years of uh of da garland and his office just uh or i'm sorry um ag garland and his office and all of the things that people like sarah kenzie have discussed with regards to the background of uh, merrick garland and why he's to say he's insufficient in this moment would be an understatement it appears by all pretty much by many many indicators of of slow walking and running the clock out and while there were some things that are probably um of benefit such as maybe the neutralizing of some of the foot soldiers as we call them like maybe oath keepers proud boys networks there was still this definite lack of accountability around these big players, including Trump himself, but then also somebody like Rudy Giuliani and uh, his uh, and the satisfaction I'm sure some people had in seeing his mugshot uh, after all of the things he's been involved in and uh, and all that is related to that. But there's these are these are not this is not the weaponized Justice Department as these MAGA people try to make it out to be. No, this is a response to that. These are people picking up and doing what the DOJ should have been doing. And as a result, we're seeing these indictments come out in these in these areas and of importance there. And then I'll just say one more thing to add uh, regarding the uh, the foot soldiers. And I think this is important as it relates to uh, the types of people who might be involved in January 6th type of things going forward. And, uh, and it is important, I think, like this, there is a neutralizing, I think, that might have taken place with regards to the Proud Boys and the, um, the Oath Keepers and groups like that. But there is, there's a almost, I, I would say you could say there's a kind of a next generation coming forth with some of these groups that have been activated to fight the extreme wokeness and the grooming agenda and all this that have risen up in uh, in suburban areas and, uh, and throughout our country since, the, uh, since Biden was elected and inaugurated. And then also what our friend uh, Tom El Oso on Twitter has, uh, or X is now X is, um, has theorized to us that the people involved in these uh, Mike Flynn Reawaken America tours, as well as these Mike Lindell uh, campaign symposiums, are being set up to be uh, the shock troops for the next set of operations that are to come post January 6th, post neutralizing of these uh, of these groups that does appear to have taken place that could be a positive uh, attribute that could be give, attributed in kind of a limited manner, but still important manner to the. Garland DOJ while still closing the lid on the serious, serious areas of accountability at the highest level. So I wanted to throw those, a couple, those factors in uh, and just add those to our conversation before we read from the indictment. No, th- those are crucial and they spark some thoughts in me too, in terms of what you brought up around the repeat of weaponizing, quote unquote, 9-11 truth uh, in a very similar kind of way that Trump did. You see Vivek using it and the mainstream media uh, platforming it very perfectly. But I think also you see with this question of the lack of indictment of seditious conspiracy of Trump and the inner circle cell around January 6th, uh, where it's we're at this point, we're still limited to these more maybe lieutenants of the seditious conspiracy being found guilty, having been charged and found guilty of seditious conspiracy uh, in terms of obviously the Oath Keepers, Stuart Road, 
the Yale Ron Paul Oath Keeper leader, uh, those though that whole part of the seditious conspiracy, and people like Seth Abramson, who has well charted large portions of the eleven nine operation itself, has pointed out that now the uh, the acknowledgement of the appearance of key Trump lawyer Ken Chesbro uh, on the ground on January 6th, apparently interfacing with Alex Jones, is a crucial factor to now you would want to see some kind of superseding indictment, actually, in relationship to Donald Trump and, and these people in relationship to a seditious conspiracy charge around January 6th, and not just what the uh, Jack Smith grand jury has apparently left it at, which is a conspiracy to defraud, I think, the U.S. government and the American people in relationship to the election, but not really going in on the, the question of uh, seditious conspiracy on January 6th. And uh, Chessbro is mentioned in that uh, that conspiracy to defraud Jack Smith indictment, I believe he's uh, the uh, unindicted co-conspirator number five in that one. And then he's named and it has been indicted in the Georgia Rico uh, case now, too. So there is that aspect here, I think, that's sort of blowing in the wind uh, to some extent, wondering whether this is this part of some kind of actual uh, justice for the obvious uh, seditious uh, conspiracy behind January 6th uh, is going to land. And I wanted to point out, too, that in terms of what you mentioned about Vivek and running the 9-11 quote-unquote truth uh, scenario, that it's resonating already with the same people. And uh, now, you know, people like Kevin Barrett from False Flag Weekly News, who on his most recent False Flag Weekly News with E. Michael Jones, where their main disagreement was what EMJ is saying, if we could only stop calling people neocons and Zionists and just talk about the Jews writ large. And then Kevin Barrett's tiny little pushback of not all Jews, but I can't disagree with your larger uh, hypothesis here in a, any kind of political manner uh, are recently getting to. Now, I would understand there is a legitimate case to be made that Kevin Barrett has been sort of jumped the shark for more than 15 years, all the way back to his early involvement with um, Jim Fetzer, which he has begun to return to again in more recent years. But uh, I gave him a second chance in many ways uh, in relationship to the 11-9 moment and uh, working with him sometimes on False Flag Weekly News. And uh, he appears to have, uh, you know, jump the shark again in my eyes in terms of believing that Vivek is some kind of actual closeted 9-11 truther in the same way that he has now said that uh, Ron, uh, what's his name, Craig? Uh, Ron Johnson. Ron Johnson, the uh, Moscow July 4ther, is some kind of uh, crypto 311 truther in terms of COVID and and Kevin gives gives a lot of credit uh, to that, and so he's doing the same thing now with Vivek, and he's setting Vivek up as uh, not as some guy who's repeating the same thing that we were dealing with back in 2016, which was the 28 pages and the Saudi intelligence involvement with some of which the is- hijackers and all that, and you, you'll find that if you elect me, who knocked down the towers? Uh, shorthand, it's the Saudis. Which is what next generation Bob Graham and the uh, Navy Secretary John Lehman, right? Yes, as they they used to do every few years in in rolling that out, and then meanwhile, then Trump's people uh, supported the Saudi coup of the the parts of the you know Saudi monarchy that used to do whispers about how the Israelis were actually at the epicenter of 9-11 and were being sort of be patsied by them to some extent, right? Even, I think it was the the king, right? It was uh, MBS's father who right. used to say things like this uh, that the entire U.S. diplomatic corps knew about. 
And uh, and so we're seeing a lot of that kind of thing where even then Kevin Barrett makes it out as if Vivek uh, is a uh, an Israel aid critic or an Israel. He's a he's actually also a crypto Zionist critic in relationship to Nikki Haley rather than, uh, you know, a uh, a member of the Shabtai organization, which is at the epicenter of American power networks of the actual Israeli uh, government power set. So so there's the same BS is being run again. It's even worse this time in certain ways. And people who in a good faith interpretation should have figured this out by now in terms of throwing in with that aspect of Donald Trump as being some kind of crypto 9-11 truther should already know to look out for the uh, for the archetype. Yeah, we're falling for Trump exposing Jeb Bush again while as the as the neocon warmonger when in reality like Trump is serving a network that uh, is actually much more hawkish when it comes to the global war on terror and you're seeing the same a similar dynamic play out with Nikki Haley and Vivek Ramaswamy, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same and all that. And one last point on uh, Ken Cheesebro is a uh, you know, whatever the truth is with this, um it clearly had an effect on um, Alex Jones and Infowars, because almost directly responding to this story, you know, this Chisbro and January 6th, uh, gaining a lot of traction um, in media and online and social media, uh, was Alex Jones came out with his biggest scoop ever, which is that the TSA whistleblower told him that we're going back to masks, which is going to lead to more lockdowns, which is going to lead to an increased reliance on mail-in voting so that they could steal the election in 2024. So very clearly, um, there were affected, and I would say it seems like shaken by this whole very uh, vulnerable to this to this new to this chess bro January sixth angle, and directly responded with just like this, uh, you know, their this version, this particular iteration of what Steve Bannon would say of just flooding the zone with bullshit. In this case, um, the what is going to obviously be a fake uh, prediction or a, a you know of like going back to lockdowns to steal the election and direct result of this, and it gained far more traction from than it had any business doing unfortunately so that was a direct response i think to uh to chess bro and the 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 correlation of it and the timing of it i think was in direct response to that it looks like it was apparently a fairly successful attempt to uh deflect attention away from that super successful and i think your identifying of the timeline there is very compelling to me because even at the time before I understood the level of importance of the Chessboro identification of January 6th in relationship to Alex Jones, I notice the way that the, that this Alex Jones major, this is one of the sort of seen as one of the most major of his, the world is going to, the world is going to end next week kind of, uh, you know, uh, exclusives or whatever. I realized that it was not only exaggerated uh, and also false on the surface as most of Alex Jones's uh, quote unquote important work about important events really is. And I noticed this very early on, even like early 9-11 truth research days when there was this prison planet thing and I began to sort of just sort of listen and see what was going on there. And immediately I noticed, because I would always go back and check facts, I would go uh, look at multiple sources, especially around 9-11, a very serious issue, especially in terms of speaking publicly about it uh, and making uh, assertions about uh, potential criminality, high-level criminality. And basically every time I would fact check Alex Jones it was either a, a, an extreme, really dishonest exaggeration of the facts, or it was a critical smearing, actually a disinformation of crucial facts. And the whole thing in the guy under the guise of uh, of red herrings and limited hangouts, in terms of the core of the actual nine eleven architecture, uh, as I began to understand more and more and more. But even in terms of looking at Alex Jones, and, and you're right, this this recent thing about how they're going to bring back COVID uh, and making it sound like it was totally made up, really, or that maybe they were going to release something new or they were just going to sort of pretend like something was happening and they were going to do the flu, the flu. They're going to blame flu deaths on COVID. 
Yeah, and 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 this went everywhere on social media. This was a big, big deal. Uh, and I just begin to like look at the local statistics. It's very difficult, actually. The 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 crucial health statistics in terms of COVID have been in large and substantial part been shut down. Uh, actually, in both locally to nationally. And so one of the few places you can actually still get some uh, understanding of actual statistics in terms of COVID is looking at some of these wastewater projects. And I saw even here locally in Lawrence that there was beginning to be a major sort of uh, uh, fairly vertical move in terms of uh, COVID statistics. And then it looks like lots of people are getting something that looks like a very bad summer cold and uh, and people test positive. Some people test positive for COVID and the 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 symptoms uh, symptomology is very similar and it's very bad head cold and looks very much like a cold and that kind of thing. So so there actually is has has been there was already an uptick in actual COVID before uh, Alex Jones made this big uh, exclusive revelation. And then uh, at the same time, now looking back on it, I see exactly what you're saying in terms of the timeline. And it's, it was very successful in knocking down and smearing the waters and saying, look over there, a squirrel, a uh, red herring kind of operation in terms of the Chessboro with Alex Jones on January 6th operation. And now Chessboro actually indicted for RICO conspiracy in Georgia. Right. And then you get a lot of people who are just part of his audience or part of these um, adjacent audiences that are also pushing this narrative that don't, you know, they don't, they're not really versed on like the ins and outs of why something like this is significant in the first place. They're just told, well, the reason why the media is bringing up anything negative about Alex Jones, Roger Stone, et cetera, at this point is because they're trying to, you know, they're go, they're smearing the person who's warning about their next big evil plan to, uh, to lock us down again and steal the election and all of this. So don't worry about any of that. It's all just, um, they're all just doing that because we're the ones telling the truth and they're trying to, they're trying to turn people against us when we're just the innocent whistleblowing truth tellers. And so that you get that. And then also, uh, also Alex Jones is setting himself up to be right when this turns out to be another failed prediction. It won't actually be another failed prediction because they're actually stopping it. And, um, you see, if it doesn't happen, it's because Alex Jones and his audience and these brave patriots actually stopped it. So, so he's right either way. That's that's nice. That's nice. It must have been what happened with the uh, diesel fuels going to run out prediction that Alex and Tucker Carlson were pushing. I guess they stopped that. They stopped the deep state globalists from from emptying our diesel supply to completely shut down the shut down our country. So, thank you. I guess we could thank them for that too. And meanwhile, v- v- the what like virtually all of the Republican candidates who are supported by the quote unquote alt media from sort of alt light to alt right for uh, sort of core MAGA to prior MAGA or now MAGA shy from, you know, those who support Trump to Vivek to RFK Jr. to DeSantis. In large part, what seems to be like the main agreement, the consensus politically is attack the quote unquote administrative state. And really rip it out, like really uh, end certain, um, you know, departments, entire departments in the government, uh, really attack the Justice Department, all of the FBI, uh, and all under the guise of this Bannon-led uh, attack on the administrative state, bureaucratic, quote-unquote, deep state, and who obviously benefits from that entirety of uh, political consensus is the same old corrupt American oligarchs. The, you know, the question of the Cokes again, right? Obviously the Cokes are behind a lot of the funding uh, going back decades in terms of aspects of quote unquote alt-right media 
and even relationship to January 6th uh, and all of that. But then on to foreign, all these foreign interests, and especially those that might be in, engaged in deep state uh, abroad, and including organized crime and financial flows, especially in the sort of post-Soviet uh, regions, uh, the stands and, and Ukraine and all of that. That that th those kinds of money flows are the ones who all will all benefit from an attack on the actual public sector. I would say at the national level, under the guise of an attack on the administrative state. Absolutely, and while the coke, um, you know, once again, this is more of that noise from like these MAGA mouthpieces and propagandists and attack dogs. Like the cokes are exposing themselves to just be rhino, uh, you know, um, fake. Uh, crony capitalists or whatever, whatever terms you want to use, because they don't, they're not going to find economically, they're not down with economically supporting another Trump term. No, what they're doing, I think what, what is probably going on is like, it's going to funnel their support to these ultimately adjacent candidates who are going to push variations of the same agenda. And I think that's magnified now because like the party has been uh, taken over to such a level while also throwing in their hats to like these, uh, these, "Quote unquote non-interventionist uh, anti-war think tanks like the Quincy, uh, like uh, the Quincy Institute, which is just it looks like um, ultimately wittingly or unwittingly is serving certain uh, you know, geopolitical interests that are actually just going to strengthen the hand of say your Russia's, for example. So uh, that's what in the while people say that's what it seems to me is going on that like oh they're just showing their true colors to be whatever like actually no like they're just I think are pulling their resources into different things that are going to advance, that are still going to advance their uh, bottom lines that still benefit from uh, from Trump or, you know, Trump adjacent post MAGA. Yes. And what, I, what I've seen is, and this may, uh, this, maybe this should be fact checked, but what I've seen is that every Republican Senator who refused to certify the election results in terms of January 6th, were backed, funded by Coke Industries PAC. Uh, and so then you'll have the sort of MAGA type saying this is proof that it was a Coke deep state conspiracy and the Cokes are the sort of the the Republican Soroses uh, and, and all of that. But I think this speaks to something even deeper, obviously, in terms of what was really behind and what continues to be, be behind this uh, this uh, sort of ultra quote unquote ultra mega moment in terms of the weaponized politics that is drawing everything, especially in the Republican primaries, uh, toward it as some kind of strange political uh, tractor. And and then meanwhile, you have uh, Charles McGonigal, who should have been this crucial FBI figure to suss out a lot of, especially the Russian. Uh, involvement in the 11-9 operation and the backing of of Trump and the entire political uh, movement in terms of all of that. Now pleading guilty, it looks like now that means maybe avoiding a trial and uh, further public uh, scrutiny of what all was going on. But was Charles McGonigal, who then shows up at the New York FBI field offices as I believe the head of counterintelligence, was he the FBI official who gave this infamous quote to the new to the infamous New York Times uh, in the run up to the 2016 election and the 11 nine operation in terms of FBI sees no I think it's FBI sees no connections between Trump and Russia. Uh, and so then meanwhile, you have the all of this overt stuff going on, including the whole Bayrock, Sapir, Trump, Soho network. And remember, a lot of this money in terms of the Russian deep state goes through some of these former Soviet satellites. So we're talking about Kazakhstan, I believe, in terms of um, the Sapir network. And you remember even uh, Oliver Stone's now current, his current Arnon Milchan is this sort of dopey guy, uh, Igor Lepotnik, who he, who Stone made uh, all the, these Ukraine quote unquote documentaries about, but they also made this very glowing and I believe even Kazakh government uh, or quasi Kazakh government backed uh, glowing documentary about the long term uh, Kazakh dictators really. 
And uh, and so this is continues to be in the mix, I think. And uh, we'll also include a link to an FBI whistleblower statement that no one, none of your favorite alt media people have even told you exists. Uh, and you can read the the uh, statement of this FBI whistleblower blacked out in certain ways and uh, a statement that was given to Jim G.Y.M. Jordan. Uh, and they decided to go with these other uh, FBI, quote unquote, whistleblowers. But this FBI whistleblower uh, statement is damning, especially in terms of Giuliani. And uh, it looks to me like the McGonagall network at work and suppressing any derogatory information that came up about Giuliani while also showing that any potential derogatory investigation into the Bidens and Hunter Biden and Burisma was actually being followed up correctly. Uh, But meanwhile, there were crucial forces in place to basically stamp out any real crucial sources that were had information around Russian intelligence operations, uh, especially in around Ukraine and the Giuliani network, Pavel Fuchs, and especially in terms of the run up to the 2020 uh, election. Um, so and then meanwhile, maybe, Greg, we should just finish up with just reading these few uh, short uh, early paragraphs in the deep state Fannie Willis indictment. Yeah, I think so. And I'll just make one more uh, final point um, going with the with the Cokes, I think is relevant to our bigger, um, the bigger pursuit of uh, deep politics and our attempts to what we call destigmatize uh, some of these um, deep political, I think, realities that we that 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 we live in that are part of our lives regarding, I think, um, a deep politics uh, important that still is important today is like these actual histories where uh, you have the, uh, you know, going back to uh, the father, Fred Koch, and his involvement with uh, doing business in Stalin's uh, Soviet Union. And then the John Birch Society background of the Koch family, that then combined with these, uh, this, what appears to maybe be like this uh, horseshoe kind of uh, uh artificial split within the uh, libertarians of uh, the Koch brothers and Ron Paul and the Rothbardians and the Austrians and these uh, um, that went on in the, you know, the 1970s, 1980s time period. And I think this all remains uh, significant in terms of like things that we're still probably seeing playing out today. And so we just uh, always want to keep, um, keep uh, eyes on the ball with regards to these uh, short term and long term um deep political aspects that i think would are still are still instrumental and are still um explanatory today all the way from this uh stalin john birch society background to whatever really went on with the um splitting of uh, the libertarian of the libertarians with ron paul and the austrians and all that this is an important point and this is an area where i think we will get uh more deeply detailed in in terms of explaining how all of this works, especially the um, political economic assumptions that are really uh, baked in to the cake of this libertarian Infowars alignment around running cover at the very least uh, for the 11-9 operation and the Trump uh, ongoing MAGA operation. Um, But I think in general, we are beginning to further realize that there is this architecture that is a very, that looks like a very strange uh, nest of bedfellows in terms of the uber hawks from the uber hawks on communism of the John Birch Society uh, from 50 years ago to now the Frank Gaffney Center for security policy type uber hawks in and then in some kind of weaponized dialectic or really what I would say is a pincher move of the weaponization of what could be deep political analysis into conspiracy culture and uh, and largely sort of con- very controlled right wing politics uh, of those who are actually in bed in business bed of some sort from the background of the Kochs, uh, as you pointed out to now the, the Trump, uh, operation, uh, as some kind of, he's an Uber, he, Trump himself is some kind of alleged Uber hawk on China while also having Chinese bank accounts, 
Uh, he's an, he's a tough guy who, who's going to stand up to the other tough guys, the other killers in the world like Putin, while also being deeply in bed with uh, Putin's deep state financial networks, uh, let alone the politics that uh, Trump served in terms of Putin during his years. Um, so I think there's a, a basic of a basics of architecture that we understand at this point, but I think there's a a detail, uh, especially in terms of the economic uh, intellectual background, that a lot of the it, a lot of this is uh, assumed uh, about, and there's very little actual consciousness around it when people buy into a uh, a MAGA or even a Q or even a Mises Caucus libertarian kind of. Uh, stance, uh, or even all politicians are bad, but uh, the deep state he still hates Trump for some reason, that there is an underlying, very detailed um, politi- political economic uh, package, a weaponized package, I would say, and in some some cases, a provably false package when you actually get into someone like Milton Friedman and the delivery of this Austrian school into the Chicago school uh, and then the what I would call the sort of very weak or fake European-based pushback from the crude Marxist types to the uh, Keynesians where in the midst of all of this is where is the actual you know real roots of the American, both political and economic tradition, which is what I keep coming back to. And so that's one thing that I'd like to explore uh, as we as we move forward. Definitely. And uh, this might and this last thing I'll say about this, this might be a little limited or this isn't a full picture, I'm sure. But what I'm seeing more and more is that all of these we talked about, like the horseshoes of the Trump era and how um, if you're, you know, OK, well, um, OK, well, Fox News and talk radio, OK. Well, here, if you're if you're past that, well, here's this, this, and this waiting for you. Like, you know, you've got, you know, Breitbart, or you've got Infowars, or you've got, we went to the other side of like the extremes of the horseshoes, uh, Rick Wiles and True News. And it seems that with these other types of things, like uh, you've got the, um, there's been, I think, long term as well as short term, just different outlets for people to go into that ultimately are designed with the narratives of to benefit and protect the interest of a very uh, specific class of um, um, economic and other people uh, of, of high big time, big money economic and otherwise interests that are very threatened by, and this is this is uh, not the full picture, but I'm just getting this at a basic level, that are that one constant remains they're very threatened by any type of serious uh, societal change that they see as affecting a specific bottom line, whether that would be in terms of um, oversight or whether that's in terms of uh, diff- changes in societal trends. So I see a long-term um, continuity there of, um, of things and narratives and outlets being set up uh, as a means to, uh, with b- pushing varying, varying versions of, I think, a bigger, very similar, bigger overall message that's designed, I think, to uh, protect certain entrenched uh, power interests. So. Yep, yep. All right. Well, Greg, what I, I uh, mistakenly I have uh, pulled up the uh, the August first uh, Jack Smith indictment of Trump, and I believe we didn't quite yet cover any of the details of it. Um, so maybe we could just uh, go through that a little bit because I think it leads in then to future consideration of the Fannie Willis Georgia uh, I- indictment, especially in terms of what I'm hearing from the working up of these talking points uh, from alt media, especially in terms of a uh, an attack on First Amendment protected core political speech uh, is being made illegal, that kind of thing. So is that cool if we just uh, deal with the first uh, few paragraphs of uh, of this uh, August 1st Jack Smith indictment? Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. All right. Okay, so this was filed August 1st, 2023 in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia, which, by the way, I believe just maybe just today was uh, it was uh, uh, scheduled for the trial date. And uh, and a lot is being made of that. It has been scheduled out to, I believe, the week it starts and it should be a multi week uh, trial. But for the week before Super Tuesday, 
of the of uh, of 2024. So Trump's lawyers were trying to push it out to 2026, which uh, was being pointed out by the uh, prosecution was basically totally unprecedented uh, in terms of a single uh, indicted defendant. And uh, and uh, the prosecution wanted this to go forward later this year, I think in the middle of the fall sometime, maybe November. And so the judge ultimately decided on a, uh, you know, in first third end of the first uh, quarter of uh, 2024 trial date. So that that actually, I believe, just uh, ske- was scheduled, uh, which is which is a prime example of the unprecedented persecution that Mr. Trump and his allies face. Yes, exactly. (laughs) All right. So this is uh, in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, United States of America versus Donald Trump defendant. uh, There are four counts. Uh, Number one is 18 U.S.C. 371, conspiracy to defraud the United States. Count two, 18 U.S.C. 1512K, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. Count three, 18 U.S.C. Section 1512 C2, two, obstruction of an attempt to obstruct an official proceeding. And then count four, 18 U.S.C. 241, conspiracy against rights, which is interesting because that's usually the section of the the U.S. code where uh, civil rights uh, violations are um, usually um, grounded in. Uh, that one, and I think the one after 241 and 242, I think, are are that. So this, so that's actually saying that there was a conspiracy against the rights of the American people, I think, is uh, what that count is actually stating. Our indictment, quote, the grand jury charges that at all times material to this indictment on or about the dates and at the approximate time stated below. Introduction one, the defendant Donald J. Trump was the 45th president of the United States and a candidate for re-election in 2020. The defendant lost the 2020 a presidential election. Two, despite having lost, the defendant was determined to remain in power. So for more than two months following Election Day on November 3rd, 2020, the defendant spread lies that there, were, there had been outcome determinative fraud in the election and that he had actually won. These claims were false and the defendant knew that they were false, but the defendant repeated and widely disseminated them anyway to make his knowingly false claims appear legitimate, create an intense national atmosphere of mistrust and anger, and erode public faith in the administration of the election. Three, the defendant had a right, like every American, to speak publicly about the election and even to claim falsely that there had been outcome determinative fraud during the election and that he had won. He was also entitled to formally challenge the results of the election through lawful and appropriate means, such as by seeking recounts or audits of the popular vote in states or filing lawsuits challenging ballots and procedures. Indeed, in many cases, the defendant did pursue these methods of, con- of contesting the election results. His efforts to change the outcome in any state through recounts, audits, or legal challenges were uniformly unsuccessful. 4. Shortly after Election Day, the defendant also pursued unlawful means of discounting legitimate votes and subverting the election results. In so doing, the defendant perpetrated three criminal conspiracies. A. A conspiracy to defraud the United States by using dishonesty, fraud, and deceit to impair, obstruct, and defeat the lawful federal government function by which the results of the presidential election are collected, counted, and certified by the federal government in violation of 18 U.S. 3, 18 USC Section 371. B. A conspiracy to corruptly obstruct and impede the January 6 congressional proceeding at which the collected results of the presidential election are counted and certified, quote, the certification proceeding, unquote, in violation of 18 U.S.C. Section 1512K, and C, a conspiracy against the right to vote and to have one's vote counted in violation of 18 U.S.C. Section 241. Each of these conspiracies, which built on the widespread mistrust the defendant was creating through pervasive and destabilizing lies 
about election fraud targeted a bedrock function of the United States federal government, the nation's process of collecting, counting, and certifying the results of the presidential election, quote, the federal government function, unquote. And that's the end of the introduction, and then it gets into the different uh, counts and describes the actual uh, conspiracy part by part. All right. Well, thank you for, for reading that. And um, uh, um, with that, if you don't have any final thoughts, I think we'll begin to wrap up here. No, I would just point out that it is uh, widely acknowledged, even by deep state Democrat Jack Smith himself, that Trump had all rights in the world to even lie about uh, the uh, the election in 2020. As we pointed out in the very beginning, in the words of Bannon, that they were actually planning to do. This was their strategy. They were going to say whatever they needed to uh, in order to, uh, you know, to make it seem like like Trump won. Now, what it appears is that the indictment is for not the quote unquote core political speech of even lying about uh, about elections but of the conspiracy to actually then take that and use that to try to disrupt uh, uh, the actual January 6th proceedings. And it also states to try to steal uh, votes uh, and uh, allegedly legitimate votes from Americans who had a lawful right to have their vote counted. Uh, in the 2020 elections. And so the combination of all of that, of the actual acts to conspire to commit an uh, unlawful acts, both disrupting this proceeding while also then trying to uh, steal lawful votes uh, beyond core political speech, even uh, dishonest uh, or deceptive political speech, uh, is why Donald Trump is beginning to be held legally accountable. It goes back to that inability to stop himself and the people around him to just stop themselves from being able to commit crimes. I mean, you know, they just can't help themselves. And uh, and I do want to I do want to make a follow up on that. In that, um, when you that's important because the the way it's being portrayed now falsely by these bad faith operators is oh they're trying to they're trying to say that's all they're doing is trying to crack down on our right to challenge or contest an election well no in the case of yeah you know people all the way from the average uh, person living in i don't know wherever to trump they have they not nothing is impeding their right to do it and even as immoral and as uh, problematic as it would be in our um in the heightened, uh, escalated discourse of uh, narratives, warfare that's going on that's been taking place for years, even if like Trump and the Bannons were to go out and say that this election was stolen, like if they don't try to like take um, false legal means or otherwise means to actually try and change the results, then you know, that's not something that they did not have like a right to do as far as like uh, their, their, their freedom of speech. And then this is different in that, no, they actually were not just doing that, but they were actually using this as a means to justify trying to do just that, putting out all this fake evidence of overwhelming voter fraud and all of this and trying to shake down the Secretary of State of Georgia to find 11,000, however many, 11,000 extra votes and all of this. And it does come into a, obviously, a criminal conspiracy here as a result. And then one more thing I'll just distinguish between um, this and one of the MAGA, one of the talking points we keep hearing is, well, other people question the challenge election results and were never held accountable for, you know, going back to 2000 and 2004, which interestingly enough, I, you know, especially in 2004 with the case of Ohio, like you've got very strong, uh, you know, it's been documented, I think, uh, of actual um, serious election um, interference. And it was never challenged outside of a few people in Congress who may have made a little bit of noise about it. But once again, we've got the distinction here is that um, there was no, you know, there weren't people within like the government within the, with actually conspiring to try and change the outcome of the election in much less really even really challenging it in general, much less like creating like this big time. There was, not even any serious effort to create a big type of time propaganda narrative warfare around the idea of the election being stolen, even though there's more actual serious um, evidence to point to that with with these uh, with these Bush elections. But it never escalated to that level, and that's a, obviously a key reason as to why the 
the very limited number of people who I think very weakly pushed back against um, the 2000, and particularly the 2004 elections, were never treated the same way that these people who actually have tried to actually um, use all sorts of means illegally and criminally to try and actually change the election results and the uh, to reinstall Trump in are are facing is that's a major major distinction. I'm glad you brought that up. It should be simple for people to understand, but I think in a lot of cases it's probably not. So I'm glad you uh, I'm glad you made a point to emphasize that. And I'm glad you brought in that that other twin pillar of the talking points about the uh, you know whether uh, you know whether it's Stacey Abrams in Georgia or back to these very shady both uh, Bush elections. 2000 and 2004, uh, that is the twin pillar of their talking points. And I would just, I would go even further in terms of di- quote unquote distinguishing uh, what's being now held to some legal account in terms of uh, the 2020 uh, part of the 11 9 operation uh, versus what actually went down in 2000, 2004, is that there is actually an, a continuing unindicted conspiracy. Uh, and a lack of account in relationship to what looks very much like a conspiracy to uh, fraud up the elections of 2000 and 2004. And then the quote-unquote losers of those those elections from Al Gore to John Kerry and their DNC architecture surrounding them, I believe, uh, and would continue to assert, were actually involved in a conspiracy to help cover up the actual nature of the election fraud conspiracy in both 2000 and 2004, with 2004 basically being the most admitted, where John Kerry himself now, that you know, 10 years later, I think admitted on uh, public radio that he himself saw evidence that uh, that the election had been stolen from him, but that he was uh, concerned about uh, legal teeth and uh, and also concerned about the how it would look and then the nature of transitions of power and and all of that it makes so, you wonder if there were other things he might have been concerned about too that he won't talk about that might have been more in terms of like uh threats i don't know threats compromise all of these uh kinds of things right we know this is 2004 was the skull and bones election uh, where Tim Russert uh, pointed it out, what do the what the American people going to think that it's these two guys uh, from this small little Yale uh, secret society? And one more, uh, and one more point is that I think this was uh, many years later, but um, one of the few congressmen who made noise about the 04 election was uh, John Conyers of Michigan, and it looks like there was a. You know, Jack Posobiec, Mike Cernovich type operation to expose him ultimately in the uh, right at the end of his life and right at the end of his time in Congress. So it looks like that was like a long term a ramification of challenging that election, or at least being as a result of that being targeted by these uh, by these very weaponized uh, MAGA networks and elements. But your basic point, Greg, is right on target. That what obviously distinguishes this is not the core political uh, nature of the core political speech about disputing an election or calling into question an election, uh, whether truth honestly or deceptively, but that there was no January 6th operation in relationship to Stacey Abrams back to John Kerry and Al Gore. Uh, and, and all of that. And so even in the midst of this just this little beginning step here of some kind of legal accountability in terms of what really was uh, Trump at the core of a seditious conspiracy and RICO operation, you're still seeing everyone from Jimmy Dore to Tim Pool and many sort of, you know, uh, uh, in those spheres and in between even weaponizing this indictment uh, in the very same way, way uh, that serves exactly what this criminal Trump syndicate was doing in the run-up between November 3rd, 2020 and, and then January 6, 2021, that they are making it seem like there is a threat against core political speech here by the sort of corrupted Justice Department rather than a sort of maybe too little, too late kind of Merrick Garland uh, 
uh, Jamie Gorelick, uh, Alan Dershowitz uh, type syndicate weak sauce uh, operation here that certain elements of the Justice Department are pushing through maybe a little bit. Uh, and in the midst of all of that, the Jimmy Doors and the Tim Pools and all of that are making, and I quote, knowingly false claims, I would say, appear legitimate and to create an intense national atmosphere of mistrust and anger, unquote. Uh, so, so I think that they should be held to civic and civil account as, quote unquote, public figures and people who engage in core political protected speech and be called out for the little uh, dupey uh, useful idiot tools in some cases maybe sort of subversively paid in terms of audience creation maybe in other ways in terms of access and political power networks but definitely cultivated into these positions of being utilized as uh, perfect useful idiots of the uh, seditionist enemies of the United States. Absolutely. And I'll just close by once by referencing our three-part series that we did right after the 2020 election, uh, seven days in November, which I think um, still stands as far as uh, the threat that we didn't know was quite to come. Uh, we speculated about what, what but obviously I think uh, the events of January 6th and some of the things that went on, um, we recorded that I think over a month before January 6th and all that, but I think it it stands up and not just in terms of like some of the concerns we had, but also like the uh, the scope I think of the where we still stand as far as like, you know, we continue to enter into uncharted waters and things that we increasingly in the past may as Americans like, uh, you know, took for granted as things that don't happen here. Like we continue to remain like in a situation where things could happen that we never would have seen happening before here. Things that just don't happen here, as people say, you know, it can't Yeah, happen. like an, an assessment of the gravity of the situation. Yeah, I think that's, that's correct. Absolutely. Right yeah. yeah, absolutely. And um, and as we continue to enter into uncharted waters, like these threats remain and they're still, you know, and it's so I just throw, I'll just close with that. All right. Well, thank you very much. I think that's a very uh, perfect place to close. And uh, well, thank you very much, Greg, for doing that with me this uh, Monday, August 28th, 2023 evening yeah, thank here you. in the radical middle of America. Thank you. All right. And thank you, everybody out there rocking with us, uh, listening and supporting us. We appreciate you. Until next time, Antidote, we are out.